Randy Saborin, who is the co-president of Practica Learning, which I believe celebrated 20 years last year. I want to say last year is when you celebrated 20 years. Um, a little bit about Randy before he takes over. Randy helps organizations to grow and develop using a combination of deliberate practice programs and business improvisation. His focus is on improving the quality of important professional conversations, whether they're internal, think coaching, leadership, DEI, peer-to-peer, -peer, or external conversations, sales, customer service, partner conversations. So without further ado, uh, join me in welcoming Randy to the stage with his presentation, Converting Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Initiatives into Measurable Change. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Charlene. Can you hear me all right? You sound great. Excellent. I noticed that in my videos going dark and bright and dark and bright, but oh well, I'll deal with it. Um, what a tough act to follow. Susan Smith was amazing. I took a ton of notes and learned a bunch of stuff. I'll probably refer to a lot of it during the, the, the presentation if, if uh, hopefully she doesn't mind or she doesn't charge me, uh, you know, commission on, on the insight. So I guess I'd like to start with this. I miss you guys. I miss going to these conferences in person. I miss buying you a free drink. I miss the awkwardness of the forced camaraderie at the casino night. But I really miss just talking to everyone, one person talking to another person, shaking your hand, getting to know you a little bit. So I hope that we can you know, get back on track soon and COVID will be over and we can go to these conferences again. Uh, this is a great substitute. Um, and, and I think uh, Opal's done a, a wonderful job, but yeah, I miss, I miss you guys. Um, and as Susan said, I'm old school. So yeah, that's how I want to uh, have these conversations just face to face. I've done about 15 of these sessions uh, so far since uh, COVID hit. Um, some of them have been presentations like this. Some of them have been more uh, like round table uh, discussions. And so I'd like to start with uh, the information that uh, I've gathered from those uh, trends in DEI, in learning and development, HR, implementing DEI strategy, along with a lot of the conversations that we're having with our clients right now on how to implement uh, their change. So there's three basic tra uh, um, trends uh, that we've seen, and I should share my screen because then you could see the slides. Mm -hmm. My apologies, I usually have this ready. There, everyone should see uh, the presentation. Charlene, looks, jump in at the- Yep, looks great, Randy. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Um, so the trends that we've been seeing uh, in these conversations um, are three things. One is complexity and attention. So we've seen uh, a lot of L&D programs that were you know, a two week workshop or a two day workshop uh, convert into online learning and then quickly get changed to narrow down to a couple of hours. And that's because attention has changed. Uh, we're easily distracted, more easily distracted when we're, um, you know, doing this through, through video calls, conversations, uh, real uh, true back and forth conversations are, are much harder. And I think the realization is that not everyone needs to know everything about every subject. So there's been a lot of uh, taking out of complexity and simplifying the concepts and the learning. Now there's a lot of support for this pre-COVID, a lot of research, um, but it's just, the focus is now becoming, what, what do you need next in your journey as an individual? Um, and that's the second focus is, or the second trend that we saw is focusing on individuals and their performance. What are the two or three things that I need to be better from a skill or from a behavioral uh, standpoint in a coaching conversation, in a DEI conversation, in a peer-to-peer -peer conversation? What are the two or three things that, that make a difference? And there's a trend that's, that we're seeing that says the ROI for that is much better than the ROI for uh, the traditional sheep dip. Tell everybody everything across the whole organization. They'll figure out how to use it in real life. And then off we go. Um, and as I said, there was a ton of research to support 
this narrowing of focus, this this uh, this increasing granularity and taking away complexity and things like micro learning, brain based learning, deliberate practice. So it's great to see it being initiated initiated in uh, the the COVID reality of it. The third trend that we saw is I think everyone's ready to implement their DEI strategy. And we've heard from the speakers today and from a lot of programs that the momentum is building. There's things happening. We're making changes. We can see the announcement from NASDAQ and from, from states and from the, the public sector, not so much private sector yet. Um, but what I wanna focus on is how we take those first two trends and really uh, change our DEI strategy into a reality, into uh, action, into a measurable behavioral change. And, and so if we think of behavior change in our organizations, we think of the conversations that we have, the important peer-to-peer -peer conversations, the coaching conversations, the recruitment conversations. That's where I want to focus uh, uh, the change because I think that'll have the next greatest impact. So that uncomfortable conversation that I saw something inappropriate in the workplace or heard something inappropriate or saw something inappropriate on a, on a Zoom call, um, or I think you should do something about this, or why don't we have more of this or more of that? Um, or my favorite, I wanna hire my university buddy because you know that would be the best fit uh, uh, for my team. So um, we all know that one. We're gonna explore that one a little bit as we go on. All those situations that confront personal bias known and unconscious or subconscious microaggressions, racism, sexism, ageism, all of the isms, all of that fear is, that's a very dangerous conversation uh, to have. You get it wrong, the consequences could be career-wise, um, but it's also invoking a lot of fear. And that really comes from that third trend that our clients are saying, we've, we've educated uh, participants, they've gone through learning, they've read the books, they know about it, but they're not implementing it. And a lot of it has to do with uh, the confidence in having that conversation. Um, so I want to focus on that conversation, because I think it's the next frontier of implementing change. I think it's where we can really get down to uh, behavioral change. And um, with that, I'd like to begin, if I can steal from Stephen Covey, with the end in mind. And so I'm going to play a, a video. Um, it's about eight minutes, 10 minutes, so bear with me. But it is a uh, conversation um, that is a real conversation. It's, um, it's a practice conversation of a DEI uh, situation. And uh, you can see how it's been handled, but it's an actual uh, uh, transcript that we took out the client information and, and, and um, uh, protected the innocent, names changed, all that kind of stuff. So let me just uh, share a different screen if I can figure out how to do that. Can you see the video, Charlene? Yes, I can, Randy. Hi, is that Camille? Yes, it is. Hi, Camille. Uh, I'm gonna be your role player coach today. Okay, okay. So can I answer any questions for you or give you any more information about it before we jump in? Uh, no, I get it. I'm just here to have the conversation about your thought process behind hiring as it pertains to di diversity and inclusion. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. And we'll be, using, we'll be using the skills list in your package as our guide. Okay, so I'm going to be Alex for you. As you can see in your notes, you've asked for some time to speak with me. I'm going to take a pause now, and then I'll start us off. Great. Okay, here we go. Hi, uh, Camille, you wanted to speak with me. Is now still a good time? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Alex, for taking the time to meet with me today. I know you have a lot on your plate. Now, the reason I wanted to speak with you today is that I, I wanted to connect and hear your thoughts on where you are at the process of uh, filling the VP role and also share my perspective on this hire as we move towards the final steps of the selection process. How does that sound to you? Sounds good to me. All right. So uh, let's start off with how you're feeling about the process overall. Talk to me about that. Well, I've actually really enjoyed the process. It's been a great opportunity for me to get uh, more of that senior management experience that I really want. Mm 
Good. Glad to hear it, Alex. And I know you've put a lot of time and effort into this team and that finding the right person for the VP position is an important objective. Uh, now, you submitted a couple of names for your shortlist, Arjun and Felicia. Uh, but you indicated to me in your email that you're leaning heavily towards Arjun. Is that right? That is right. Arjun is my guy. He's the best. Okay. Talk to me about that. Why do you think Arjun is the best for the role? Uh, well, he is well-respected. He's an affable guy. Because of his background in sales, he can manage multiple stakeholders. Uh, he's great at managing clients and vendors, but he can really hold his ground when he's under pressure. Okay. So let's look at the other candidate, Felicia. Mm -hmm. What did you learn about her during this selection process? I, you know, Felicia is great. Uh, I just don't know if she's a good fit for the role. Okay. I need more than that. What do, how do they compare when you look at the key qualifiers for the role? Uh, well, uh, both are actually equally qualified. Both have graduate degrees, both have 10 plus years in their function. But as I mentioned, Arjun does have a background in sales, whereas Felicia is from finance. So what are you planning to use as the deciding factor then? Well, I guess it just comes down to who's the better fit. You know, it's important to have some of that executive presence at such a senior level. So are you concerned about the optics of you choosing based on something intangible like fit? Well, well Felicia tends to take things personally, a bit emotional. She, she really digs her heels in when things don't go her way. So, Alex, do you think that your previous relationship with Arjun unfairly influences you? Uh, no, not really. But you're saying that Arjun has all the right characteristics and that Felicia is just not a good leader. Uh, no, I'm not saying that. Don't you think that characterizing her as emotional could potentially be viewed as you stereotyping her? Are you sure you are making this decision based on facts or could something else be at play? Well, it sounds like you think that something... Look, I... I'm not comfortable with where this is going. There's nothing to be uncomfortable about. Where do you think this is going? Well, it sounds like that you, you're you telling me that I'm not leaning towards Felicia because she is a woman. Is that what you're saying? Because I would never exclude anyone because she is a woman. That is not who I am. And anybody who knows me would say the same. I didn't say that. All I'm saying is that you need to consider how you may be biased in favor of Arjun and give due consideration to Felicia. So I should hire Felicia to avoid the appearance of bias. Isn't that discriminating against Arjun because he is a man? How is that any better? I'm not saying you need to be aware. I'm not. I'm saying you need to be aware that you can't pretend it doesn't exist. And I want you to make your decision based on fact. Yep. Okay, Camille, we <laughs> are out of the role Oh, you got me mad. <laughs> How are you feeling about that in general? Oh, it was pretty uncomfortable, to be honest. That is fair. And I completely understand that sense of discomfort. I mean, you yourself said that these can be tough conversations. Yeah. yeah. So uh, let me tell you the way feedback is going to work. We're first going to highlight some strengths from that conversation. Then we'll transition, take a look at some opportunities to make it even better. And hopefully address some of that discomfort. Sound good? Sounds good. Sure. Okay. So tell me, from your point of view, what is one skill that you demonstrated as a leader that you feel was a strength? Um, well, I thought I started out well, and uh, we were focused on the pros and cons of the two candidates. Mm -hmm. You know what, I agree. I actually wanted to comment on that section. Are you ready for some feedback from me? Sure. Great. Okay, so you asked a series of strong, open-ended questions. You asked me, uh, why do you think Arjun is the best role? How does that measure up against the key performance indicators for the role? And what did you learn about Felicia during the selection process? So I, I want to tell you that uh, I felt uh, consulted and open and encouraged to actively participate in the conversation. But the real payoff to you as a leader is that you got some crucial information about my perspective. And that allowed you to guide the conversation coach me much more effectively. Well done. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let's transition to some uh, opportunities for improvement. If you had the chance to do this conversation over again, is there is there anything that you would have done different? Um, I, you didn't exactly take my feedback well. Okay, tell me more about how you experienced that. Well, it, you got pretty heated and defensive about it. 
Uh, I did get pretty heated, didn't I? Well, let's let's explore why and maybe talk about some ways in which we could have steered this in a different direction. Okay. So there was a critical moment in the conversation where you asked me if, if me characterizing Felicia as emotional was a potential stereotype. That made me nervous. And I said, I'm really uncomfortable with where this is going. Uh, right. I remember. Yeah. And you responded by saying, there's nothing to be uncomfortable about where you think this is going. I'm going to be honest and transparent with you here, Camille. In that moment, I felt attacked. And the result of that was I got scared. And like most people, when I am scared, I get defensive. And that made it really, really difficult for you and I to talk openly with each other. Now, your instinct that 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 is pretty much on target, that I'm leaning towards Arjun because of infinity bias or maybe even a gender bias. But in order for me to increase my awareness of those biases, I need to feel open to having that conversation. So I wanna recommend using the skill of acknowledge with empathy to take down the temperature, okay? And then ask me a probing question to understand my perspective. Okay. 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 So what could you have said to me to acknowledge and empathize with me in that moment? Oh, um, I guess I could have said that I can appreciate your feelings, that mm -hmm. it's, understandable to be nervous or upset by this type of discussion. Great, great. Okay, I wanna give you a chance to use that skill and then ask me a question to encourage me to expand on my perspective and we can see what the difference is, okay? Okay, let's do it. <laughs> Absolutely, okay. So I'll start us off, here we go. I am really uncomfortable with, with where this conversation is going. Alex. I can appreciate that these conversations are uncomfortable. I, I totally get it. It's hard to talk about these issues. Uh, you said that you don't like where this is going. Uh, tell me more about that. What are your feelings about this situation? Well, I, I, I don't want anyone to think of me not, as not taking women seriously. It's not who I am at all. I mean, not to mention the consequences to me. If that's the story being put out there, I could lose my job. Thank you for sharing that with me. Uh, this is a really important conversation. Now, first, let me say this is private between you and me. So there's no story being put out there. Even, even though these conversations can be uncomfortable, I want you to feel safe having them. Um, as a leader, um, my goal is to help you talk through the situation and share some perspective on any gaps or assumptions in your thinking so that we can make the best choice possible. Would you be open to doing that with me, Alex? Okay, Camille, this is much better. Now I'm feeling open, more comfortable. So keep going. Now you can be much more direct with me. What were the gaps that you noticed in my thinking? Keep going. Uh, we all have our own individual preferences and even biases. Uh, it can't be avoided. So the best that we can do is, is to try to bring awareness to them and manage them. Okay. okay. Um, you mentioned that Felicia doesn't have executive presence. And I wanted to point out that that phrase can mean totally different things to different people. And similarly, you described Arjun as standing his ground, whereas Felicia digs her heels in when things get tough. Now, interestingly enough, these are the same behavior that you described, but you see it as a positive behavior in Arjun, whereas it's a negative in Felicia. Now, this is one way that different types of biases, conscious or unconscious, can filter into the workplace. Hmm. You know, I actually had never thought about it in that way before. Great. So, so Alex, now that we're aware that there may be some unconscious bias at play here, how can you proceed to make the right decision? Well, I guess I would, as a uh, next step, I guess I could work up an analysis of the two candidates that line up with each competency and each KPI. Um, and maybe you and I could Take some time to review that? I think that sounds great, Alex. Okay, Camille, let's stop there. How did that go for you? <laughs> that was so much better. You were so much, much less defensive. 
<laughs> agreed, agreed. Now, the simple act of acknowledging fact, not dismissing or avoiding it, but acknowledging, these are in fact very tough conversations and that it's okay to feel that way allowed for the conversation to open up. And as a result, I was able to take in your feedback without feeling defensive, as you say. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. You are very welcome. Okay. Well, Camille, that ends our session today. Thank you so much for jumping in and practicing with me there. What I'd like to do now is... I'm going to stop there. Get the, oops, get the presentation back up. Excellent. Um, so for me, that's the level of interaction that we need in order to make change happen. And um, as Susan said uh, toward the end of her presentation, it's that almost that checking in that individual conversation because that's where the environment is created for a safe place for a conversation. Um, and that's where the change really happens. Um, there's a lot of other changes that have to go on at the same time, of course, policy, institutional change, education, but all of those things don't address two people having a conversation and uh, the aha moments uh, that you saw from, uh, uh, from Camille uh, during, during that practice session. So how do we get there? So, well, we start where we are. We've survived COVID, yay. Well, survived, uh, I guess surviving is probably the, the better way to put that. Um, but this has been a trauma. Um, there's a real thing called disease threat that uh, is an unconscious bias that increases our bias against uh, things external, things unknown, things different. So it takes away uh, resources and attention from things like innovation and creativity and learning and being open to new ideas. So we've, we have to fight that. That's a real thing. There is also resentment that could be attached to the fact that now I need to work at home or I had to change jobs or the world is different. It's not the way uh, uh, you know, I want it to be. So there's some negative pressures from COVID um, you know, that we have to address. And I think there's been some great work on understanding that. And again, back to the check-ins that I heard Susan say, um, that's a wonderful way to do it. On the positive side, we've seen this social change and momentum that's been excellent. Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement from, from pre-COVID, all of those things are social pressure pushing us to change. And I think that's uh, a critical uh, piece to, to the puzzle and, and the momentum that we need to keep going. Uh, HR, DEI, L&D has seen an increased presence in the C-suite. Um, I think that's a great opportunity that we need to uh, foster. I've noticed personally that there's a lot more chief diversity officer titles um, on LinkedIn. In fact, there's some LinkedIn research that says basically uh, job postings with diversity and inclusion inc included have increased basically four to five times in the last five years. That's wonderful. I've seen uh, people that I've known for years that have been promoted or taken on new jobs. Uh, wonderful uh, uh, change there. Um, it's also happened in the L&D organization and the HR organization. The seats at the C-suite have in increased dramatically. 66% of L&D uh, professionals say that their role is much more strategic since uh, COVID. 68% say the sense of urgency around learning programs has increased, so that's wonderful. Um, in pre-COVID, so October 2019, learning and development professionals said that their CEOs were active champions of learning only 29% of the time. Jump ahead a year, that's up to 70%. So great, CEOs are, are involved in some great research uh, about that. So we've engaged, we've um, created DEI strategy and policy and our organizations are ready for change. We've, we've done a uh, great change there. And I think in a lot of organizations where we are today is that we've created the learning content and we're you know either updating it or it's being disseminated and we're at that point of, uh, of, of change. And 
I think this is where we have to pause and look at how we've how successfully we've solved this problem in the past. And there's some unflattering data about the success of change management, uh, L and D's role in in culture change and, and changing things like a coaching culture or a sales culture or or leadership development. Um, and I say these things uh, so that we can learn from them. I'm not trying to be negative about the industry that 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 I love. Um, but a lot of the data from pre-COVID suggests that we need to approach DEI change in a different way. Only 5% of cultural programs are deemed to be uh, successful. That's a pretty small number. That's a pretty poor ROI. 8% of CEOs are satisfied with the changes they see from, from L&D. 80% of business leaders think L&D um, need to be more uh, innovative. Um, the one that blows me away is that the average of the uh, an average NPS of L and D organizations, uh, mostly large organizations, is minus twenty five. That's an incredible uh, stat, and so we can't approach solving this the way we've done it previously. Now, DEI as as uh, a change uh, culture change uh, movement has well either over the last uh, five or 10 years. In fact, some say it's, it's gone the opposite direction. The data is pretty startling. Only 5% of Fortune 500 CP, uh, CEOs are women and only 4% of Fortune 500 CEOs are minority. That means 91% of Fortune 500 CEOs are straight white males. And a stat that blows me away, there are more CEOs named John than there are women or minority CEOs combined in the Fortune 500. The 3,000 largest publicly traded companies only have a minority combination, women or minority, 12% of their boards. Um, the increase over the last five years of that changing at a um, executive level, uh, as like an executive team level, has only been 1% increase in women or diversity or, or minorities uh, uh, being judged. Uh, that's in, in the USA. The country that got it best in the world, the UK has only increased by 5%. So I, again, I just wanna highlight that we, we, we can't apply the same change methodologies that we did pre-COVID because the results are not great. Now, I think there has been some recent changes that have been outstanding. Um, the NASDAQ, uh, changes. There, you know, two directors need to be uh, diverse or or uh, uh, women or diversity. Um, although there is a nice little hook in there that says we well, can comply or explain why you can't. Goldman Sachs says one director on your board of twelve to fifteen members should be diverse or or female. Um, but there are other stuff like the state of California has made some changes. Um, a stat that I thought was very interesting was that uh, straight white men are a minority on the following boards. Apple, Alphabet, Facebook, Microsoft. That's great. And if we combine that with the uh, uh, new CEO at, at CVS and the new CEO at Walgreens, I think there's some positive change. Those are big systemic changes. I'd like us to focus again though on internally and those uh, conversational changes because that's where it'll make a difference um, uh, in, a, in our organization. So the question for me becomes, do we approach this in the traditional means. Um, and I'm saying, no, we have to go beyond what we did pre-COVID in order to uh, make those uh, significant changes. And so what I'd like to suggest is that um, if we wanna turn our policy and strategy into reality, we really need to focus on safe, measurable, professional coaching. So take your DEI training and turn it into practice conversations. Use the resources that you have of uh, facilitators, uh, HR professionals, and create those one-on-one -on -one conversations, those check-ins um, that Susan me mentioned to have, to practice those conversations. Give your people a safe place where they can make a mistake without consequence. And in fact, the only consequence would be learning. Um, and I think if we, uh, right now, the research says that we spend about 80% of our L&D budgets on content. And we know um, uh, for the L&D professionals in the room, 
the 70-20-10 model that people learn 70% of the time by doing, by being in the field, by practicing with a, a professional coach. So I think we should re-look at how we're spending budget and put a lot more of it to practicing coaching and feedback than to telling people how they should act. And the reason why is important. If we think of those trends that I started with, uh, where you know we're we're taking away complexity and we're focusing on individuals, that's extremely extremely important when it comes to DEI, because my biases are my own. Um, I can read about them, I can understand them, but until I get feedback that says I'm coming across in a different way than I intended. And the consequences of that action is, you know, like in the video we saw, that's the aha moment that I need personally so that I change my behavior. And, it, you know, one aha moment isn't enough. It's, it's got to be practiced and, and, and thought about and, and worked on and, and given feedback for so that, that I can understand it. That's the difference. And if we look at how we've changed before, um, to much less delicate, much less dangerous topics, coaching, leadership development, sales training. Um, the track record we have previous to COVID isn't that great. And I think we have to apply something different uh, for DEI conversations so that we really increase that self-awareness through interaction, through action. Um, and the last thing I'd like to, to leave you with is I think we're close to time. And this was a quote from one of the roundtables. Um, the issues of DEI are rooted in individual and individual change, and it has to be addressed there. Um, more so than anything else we've done as HR professionals or DEI professionals or learning and development professionals. So that's where I'd like to leave it. Charlene, I think we're at time. I don't know if I have time for questions or I'd like to squeeze one in, Randy, but I, I also want to mention we've had several people comment asking if they could get a copy of the video that you had showed. Oh, absolutely. In your presentation. Absolutely. So perfect. So we can we can send that out to the group um, in in the chat, and then Randy, I'll get that from you so we can share that with everyone. But I think an important question is these one to one conversations have always been vital, right? But why are they even more vital now? And, and how are they helping with that long-term change that we are hoping and trying to achieve? I think there's um, the opportunity of COVID, if you want to look at it that way, has, has helped. We're, we're even more isolated. So, and again, I'll go back to Susan's presentation. We have to make those, those check-ins deliberate and we have to have it. So the opportunity is there for it. Um, but this is behavioral change on an individual level. And if you get a sales conversation or a coaching conversation wrong, it doesn't cost anyone their job. It doesn't change how they feel about being someone in an organization. Um, I mean, it does, but it doesn't to, to the extent that a DEI conversation does. So I think that's the answer to the question is that this is really important. If we want to make this change, and I say that with a little bit of skepticism because so far, a lot of the change we've seen has been, you know, town halls and talking and listening and, and hiring one or two people. We're yet to see big budget, like this is important change to our organization. The words have been said, but will the actual change happen? And, and again, I'll, I'll quote Susan because it's her job to keep this visible in front of her board and her CEO and her people. And if they want to see an ROI of change, then we can measure these behaviors as, or these conversations as we're having them. That's easy enough for any coach, uh, any, uh, any role player, like you saw in the video. That video, they were measuring all the skills of that conversation as it was going on. So the process exists. And now the opportunity and hopefully the momentum and the will uh, now exist to change as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful ending note there, the momentum and the will, like that's, we definitely should broadcast that and really think about that today with the session. So Agreed. with that, Randy, I could ask more, but we are at time. Um, so uh, I'd like to say thank you so much. Um, we'll send that video. If you could send us the video, send it to me and we'll Absolutely. share it with everyone uh, as soon as we get it to all of you guys. And, uh, and I wish Randy, thank you. And, and we'll get ready for our next keynote.
Thanks for having me and we'll see everyone live uh, at some point in the near future. Thank you, Randy.